This is our Pastor's Corner teaching series. In this series, we've been going through the book of James, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But finally at the end of chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, we're going to invite you to open it up to James 1, verses 26 to 27. That's James 1, verse 26 to 27. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. One of the great things about this book that James writes is that it's a very practical book on how we can live out our faith. And he comes across now uh, and he introduces this concept or this idea of our tongues, right? Uh, it's a very important subject for James. In fact, he will dedicate chapter 3 and chapter 4. He'll talk about that a bit more, but he's going to introduce it to us here at this point. James uh, starts here by using this word religion. It's a very difficult word uh, to hear and maybe even grasp. Um, religion at its core uh, is really a set of rules and guidelines. I often think of Christianity not necessarily as a religion, but more so as a relationship. But as I continue to think about that more, I realize every relationship does indeed have rules and guidelines. After all, there are rules and guidelines that govern my relationship with my wife or rules and guidelines that govern my relationship with my kids. And so even there are rules and guidelines that govern our relationship with God. Point James gives us uh, this illustration of how we can tell a person's religion or his relationship with God. He gives us the image of our tongue, that little fleshy pink mass that's in our mouth. It's used for tasting yummy food, but it's also the same instrument that we use to speak. And so James uses this illustration of a reining in of our tongue, the idea of a horse. Uh, the horses back then, of course, and even to today, they would have a bit in their mouth. That bit in their mouth can control a horse. A, a horse is a powerful beast, but that little bit can actually control whether the horse goes left or right or whether it's even stop. It's kind of like the, the steering wheel and the brake pedal of your car. And the illustration is that our tongue is just as powerful uh, 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 and it can be used in so many different ways. It can be used to praise God and at the same time it can be used to encourage someone but at the same time it can also be used to tear down someone. It can also be used to curse God. Um, so James is not necessarily addressing the how we sound. He's not saying like use your tongue to sound super spiritual, to say holy things or to say always the right things. He's also addressing the fact that our tongue can also be used to do bad things like gossip, lie, slander someone, uh, cursing. Uh, sometimes people just attribute this verse only to like swearing. But again, swearing is only just a tip of the iceberg. After all, we can say all different kinds of words uh, to substitute what's really in our heart, even though we're not really swearing. Uh, but so the thing is that we need to also consider something else nowadays too. It's not just our tongue, but our fingers as well. After all, what we say to a person is no longer how we sound and what we're saying, but it's also what we type nowadays with social media, with emails, with text messages. All in all is to say that we need to consider the words that we're using um, and how they can impact others. It's not to just fly off the cuff. It's not to just sound all rosy, but at the same time, there are some devastating things that we can really do. So James is talking about the tongue and he's saying, this is what we don't do. We don't use our tongue uh, for evil purposes such as gossip, lying, sarcasm, all these kinds of things. But then he does want to give us an illustration of what we should do. And so he says, if you really want to think of yourself as spiritual, if you really think you have this relationship with God, then it's really going to come out in your compassion, in your compassion towards who? Well, he labels them as orphans and as widows here. The act of compassion is what we do. The tongue is what we don't do, right? And so it's, a, it's not a call necessarily for us to, every Christian out there to start go and adopt uh, every orphan child out there. It's not for us to simply all of a sudden start visiting all the people who've, uh, who've been widowed. Um, James is talking about a deep compassion uh, for, that we have towards people. See, if we look at someone and we see their need and we feel absolutely nothing for them, James is going to call into question whether or not you genuinely have faith. Because genuine faith leads to deep compassion for people. After all, that's how Jesus dealt with many people when he was on this earth. Every person he saw, it says he had deep compassion. He felt compassion for them. It was in his gut. He loved them that much. And so I guess the question for us is when we see other people, do we have a compassion for them? Uh, not just orphans and widows, but just people in general. Do we have that? 
But why does he use orphans and widows? Because back then, in James's time, orphans and widows were people who had no rights, they had no value, they had no dignity. And in fact, if you loved them and you showed compassion on them, there was absolutely no way that they could love you back. There was absolutely no way they could pay you back or repay you for anything that you would ever do for them. And so to carry that illustration over to today, we need to be asking ourselves, who are the people out there that we should be showing compassion to? People, in fact, it's easy to love people who will love us back. It's harder to love people where we get nothing in return. So orphans and widows today look like people like this. They're, they're the homeless. They're those dealing with mental health challenges. It's, it's a teenage mother who's, who's having a baby. It's, it's the elderly and the sick in the hospital beds. It is people who are on their own, who are lonely and have no one. Uh, all these are the various types of people out there that when we show love, we should feel something uh, when we see them. We should feel some form of compassion when we see them. But at the same time, when we express love to them, genuine love to them, there's absolutely no way they can pay us back. And James concludes uh, these couple verses with this notion of what it means for us to not be polluted by the world. And what does that mean? It's hard because as Christians, we are in the world. Uh, we're not the same as everyone else in the world. We're called to live a little bit differently. Um, and that difference is what would draw people to see Jesus. But what does it mean for us to not be polluted by the world? Uh, for some of us, that means we need to, some deep-seated change. There are some things in our lives that really need to change, that need to be done differently than how other people would do them. So our perception, our, our perspective on money, our perspective on our um, relationships. These are supposed to be done a little bit differently. Uh, oftentimes Christians are known more for what they stand against, right? Everyone knows that uh, Christians can tend to be very judgmental, right? And oh, you're always against this and you're always against that. And some people think that be not being polluted by the world is to avoid all the things that this world does, like avoid movies, avoid certain music, avoid people who are bad. Um, that's not necessarily where James is going with this. He's talking about the very fact that deep in us, we have values and desires. Deep in us, we have the things that we long for. And the question is, are those core values that we have, are they really different from the world? Are they God's values or are they really worldly values? Uh, and so there's nothing wrong with having friends who are not Christian. In fact, how else are they supposed to know who Jesus is if you're not the one there for them and telling them about it? It's not bad to watch movies. We can appreciate art and we can appreciate entertainment. Uh, but what is the deep-seated value that we have? It's not bad to go on vacations. It's not bad to go buy stuff. But what are the deep-seated values that we have with that? See. If all we do is spend time watching TV and not really advancing the gospel, maybe there's something wrong that we need to look at. If every vacation we have is only spent going to the beach uh, and never considering maybe doing something of the work of God on short-term missions, maybe we need to reconsider that. If all our money is always spent about buying stuff, getting stuff, and getting more, and we never figure out how to redirect our money to giving generously or even reinvesting it for God's purposes, then we need to consider that more. It's not so much about what we are against, but also what we stand for. We stand for God. We want to advance God's purposes. We want to ensure that widows and orphans are taken care of. So what are we supposed to do with this? I want to invite you to consider a couple practical things throughout your week. Now, the first is the question is, how is your tongue? Um, is our tongue being used really to praise God? Is it being used to encourage? Is it being used to uplift others? Or is our tongue really being used to tear people down, to express rage, uh, frustration? Is it used to gossip? Is it used to slander? So let's take some time to re-examine how we use our tongue. Um, maybe we need to write that down and see if there's a progression of improvement uh, for some of us. Um, the second thing then is how do we practically show love and compassion to people? Again, one of the great monikers of our faith is that when we see someone in need, do we feel anything? Uh, and if we don't, we need to re really examine where is our relationship with God. So after all, God has loved us. We are unlovable and we don't really have any way to pay him back. And God is inviting us to do that as well, to love those who can't pay you back, who can't love you back. Uh, so just think through that uh, throughout your week. Let's think about how we're showing love and compassion to others. So that's it for this week on our Pastor's Corner teaching series. We'll see you again next time. Love and peace.